right now. Uh, Caitlin Collins said, uh, you're getting some new information. What are you learning? Yeah, well, this is notable given that we know President Trump never called Joe Biden after he won the presidency. They never spoke. He never invited him to the White House, as, of course, is precedent. But my colleague Kevin Liptak is breaking some news right now, which is that President Trump did leave a letter for his successor in the White House before he left Joint Base Andrews and or left to go to Joint Base Andrews just a few moments ago. And of course, Wolf, that is tradition. If you remember uh, back after Obama had invited Trump to the White House, he also left him a letter in the Resolute Desk, I believe, in the Oval Office uh, for when he came into the office after he was inaugurated. And that was a letter that President Trump loved to show off to people. He often talked about um, how gracious the Obamas were during the transition. He even mentioned it in his inauguration speech, actually. Actually, four years ago, just a few moment, moments in, he said they had been magnificent. Of course, he has not treated the Bidens in the same manner, but he did leave Joe Biden a letter. What's still unclear, Wolf, and what we may learn in the coming days is what that letter says and what message President Trump left for Joe Biden, given he has broken basically every other norm when it comes to the transition of power. We know that he did apparently keep up with this one, according to my colleague Kevin Liptak. Well, why was it so difficult, uh, so impossible, Caitlin, for this uh, outgoing president of the United States to do what every other president has done, mention the new president by name, congratulate the new president uh, by name, uh, invite the new president over to the White House, do what every other president has done. This is the first time, as we keep pointing out, in 152 years that the outgoing president hasn't been at the inauguration of his successor. Why was that so difficult for Donald Trump? I, I think President Trump told us that the day of the election, when we saw him go to his campaign headquarters before, of course, the polls were closed, and he said that he was not a very good loser. And we saw that come to life over the last two months, Wolf, where the president refused to accept reality, refused to accept the results, and refused to even mention Joe Biden's name as he did not in his farewell address that he recorded. He didn't mention it just there at Joint Base Andrews. We're told that they actually had prepared some scripted remarks for the president for this morning, talking about the transition in the new administration. Of course, he scrapped those. He did not use a teleprompter. Um, so I think the president said it himself, Wolf, for why he could not accept this in the way that we've seen other presidents do. Yeah, it was really, really not, uh, not in the best traditions of the United States of America. Arlette Sines, uh, you're watching uh, the, uh, the next president of the United States at this church service. He is, as we keep pointing out, a religious man, a man of deep faith only the second Catholic to be elected president of the United States. Uh, give us a little background on what, what's unfolding right now. Well, Wolf, what we are seeing right now is President-elect Biden turning once again to his Catholic faith, which has really been a mainstay throughout his life. As you mentioned, he will be the second Catholic to become president, following in the footsteps of President John F. Kennedy, whose funeral mass was actually held in that very church that Biden is attending mass this morning. And you saw the president-elect inviting those congressional leaders, trying to send this message of unity as they are visiting that church this morning. Now, uh, in the past, for Biden's past inaugurations as vice president, he held a private mass with his family to uh, ring in that day. And over the course of the campaign, you saw Biden attending mass back in Delaware. Also, when he was out on the campaign trail, he would quietly find churches to slip into to attend ma mass while he was traveling the country. And you often saw Biden uh, turning to events at churches. He is very comfortable it being in a church, speaking in a church, as faith is really central to who he is. Now, one thing that will be very interesting to watch in the coming weeks is what Biden's church-going habits will be like here in Washington, D.C. Will he decide to attend one Catholic church regularly, or could he perhaps visit various Catholic churches around the city? But it's very clear that the, his Catholic faith has been central to his upbringing, to his, the, the way that he views the world, and the way that he carries himself, and that is something that we expect to see continue into the White House with him. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Arlette. Uh, he's a regular uh, church attendant. He goes to church all of the time, goes to Mass, practices his Catholic faith. Uh, J Jeff Zeleny, you're getting some new information on uh, what we might be hearing from the president-elect as, as right after he's sworn in as the new president. 
Well, if we did see uh, President-elect Joe Biden leaving the Blair House just a short time ago, and I'm told that is where that he put the finishing touches on the inaugural speech that we're going to hear in just a couple hours. Uh, of course, this is a speech he's been working on for a couple months. I'm told bit by bit, day by day, he would have ideas, meet with his team. But the one overarching theme, I am told, a glimpse of that came from his victory speech on November 7th. He said, let's give each other a chance. So that is going to be an underarching, underlying message here, talking about giving Republicans uh, you know, some space here, giving one another a chance to work together. We've been talking about how we are turning a page. That certainly is a central uh, theme of his approach. But also, he wants to turn the page back to a time when people work together. We'll see how possible that is in today's Washington. But I am also told by talking to advisors to the president-elect that he has not been consumed by President Trump. These last two and a half months or so, he's been very confident in his victory that's been affirmed again and again and again in court decisions. Uh, and he's not been consumed by President Trump at all. He's also urged his advisors and his team to not be consumed by President Trump. He's urged them to look beyond that. President Trump is not living in Joe Biden's head. It was quite the opposite clearly over the last few months here. So as we uh, hear the inaugural address, I'm told it's going to be about 20 minutes or so in length, which is slightly longer than some speeches. Bill Clinton famously had a 14 minute inaugural address on his first address. But I can tell you, as you can see, it's very windy out here and quite chilly with the wind chill, which will be blowing directly in his face. But you can see behind me, uh, perhaps uh, the stage is being set now and it is remarkably different than other years. These chairs are two by two. Senators will be sitting uh, farther from each other. The, f the former living presidents who are here will not be sitting next to each other. Uh, you know, there will be some space between them, but they are also handing out blue inaugural blankets for uh, the uh, guests who are here. Uh, so certainly a different uh, setting, but as the sun is now shining here, over the Capitol. It is a different sense. And now the moment of celebration comes. It certainly has been a somber inaugural activity, you know, uh, recognizing the uh, coronavirus challenges and other matters. I am told this speech, though, will be a path forward for the country. Specifics of what he intends to do, that will come later in a joint address to Congress next month. And indeed, when he goes to the White House this afternoon, he will be signing more than 15 executive actions, rescinding much of what President Trump did in office, certainly the Muslim travel ban, other controversial matters. But for now, at least, this inaugural address will try and be a lofty, urging the country, let's give each other a chance. Well, and it's important to note, uh, I think this will be significant, and let me bring John King into this. Uh, John. Uh, uh, former President Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton will be there. Former President George W. Bush, Laura Bush will be there. Barack, former President Barack Obama, Michelle Obama will be there. Uh, and the uh, current Vice President, soon to be former Vice President Mike Pence, will be there as well. Current President will not be there. Always a critical part of a presidential inaugural to show the tradition, the peaceful transfer of power, a day which partisanship is not supposed to matter. All the more so important today because the president who is leaving town, who has now left town, does not respect those traditions. And the president who has now left town uh, inspired an attack on that building you're seeing on your screen right now where the inauguration will take place. So all the more important, I think, that the United States send a signal to the world uh, that democracy not only survived but repelled an attack from within, an attack inspired by the very president of the United States. And I think what Jeff Zeleny just said about the tone is very important. We sat here four years ago, Wolf, and Donald Trump gave an inaugural address in which he spoke darkly of American carnage. Uh, today, Joe Biden has to speak about the American challenge. Uh, the pandemic is at a record high in numbers right now, perhaps plateauing a bit, but the vaccine rollout challenge awaits the new president. Uh, the world is watching this. Uh, the United States is rejoining the Paris Climate Accords, uh, showing again respect for the NATO and other allies around the world. On uh, this page-turning day, the economy is bleeding jobs. And yes, uh, we have an inaugural unlike any other, in part because of COVID, that's the separation of the seats, but in part because of the insurrection inspired by a president of the United States that has this remarkable fortress-like atmosphere around it. So Joe Biden has to, in his first moment as president, acknowledge that he becomes president at a moment of several crises, 
a challenge to the political system, a challenge of domestic terrorism, the number one challenge of the pandemic and its domino effect on the economy and everything else. But the resilience of Joe Biden has been a testament and a trademark of his career. And I think that's what he wants to project to the American people today. Yeah, times are tough. Let's get to it. What a difference that election makes. Two very, very different men, uh, two very, very different presidents. Uh, we expect arrivals for the inaugural ceremony to get underway very, very soon. We're going to follow Joe Biden as he leaves church uh, uh, and heads to the U.S. Capitol, his final journey before becoming the 46th President of the United States. The inauguration of Joe Biden is brought to you by Cisco, the bridge to possible. Between what is hoped for and what can be, there's a bridge between endangered and protected. There's a bridge between chaos and wonder. There's a bridge there from the beginning to where we stand today. One company, one promise. If you can imagine it, we will build a bridge to get you there. Cisco, the bridge to possible.